Okay, now we're going to touch upon something that kind of pulls it together from my childhood, and you might remember it also. Uh, whenever I tell you that things surrounded me and constantly were showing me this during my childhood with simple things like uh, Journey, the rock group's album covers, and well, a lot of rock and roll album covers, and songs too, and sticks, and all these different people that had these things that looked like they were interested somehow in ancient knowledge, and especially heavy metal. But what we're going to talk today is this symbol right here, this live long and prosper that's shown here. When me and my brother were growing up, we were very much into Star Trek, and even in later dates, uh, I, I started getting him special gifts that were Star Wars related, and it got out of hand. We'll just say that. But uh, he even had uh, Star Wars um, Enterprise uh, Christmas decorations on a tree, and if you hit the button, it would do things, have little lights on it and stuff. Anyhow, I, and I got him a Leonard Nimoy Live Long and Prosper hand-signed for him one time. But, and, and I thought it was going to be the culmination of all the things, but he goes, I'm not really that into it, like a Trekkie or freakouts. And uh, so it, it, it kind of became a weird thing that I had, I had gone too far and probably spent too much money on this that was something that was different. Well, just a couple of years ago, he passed away and it made something different. And, and uh, you know, while I could have gotten him a pair of gloves or something like that, between him and I, I felt like that that meant a little more and something that we could grasp upon, but then also there was much more known to it. Now, him, Leonard Nimoy is himself in one of his later uh, interviews describing this to some person, and so I'm, I'm going to see if I can do this by clipping it up some and, and it won't get flagged, for I'm just using this for research purposes and something like this. It's not like I'm trying to do it out of it. But he's describing where in the series, in one of the first things they had going on, they had developed a backstory for him. And this was where he had to go back to his own home planet of Vulcan. And of course, Vulcan has to do with the gods and everything too. There's a lot of it in all the little symbology, but he had to go back to Vulcan and meet up with this, which is Tapau. Now she is the divine mother of all of the Vulcans in a way. You could say she's the queen mother, she's this, she's that, she's that symbology. She's the Shekinah, she is Asherah, she is many things. But whenever they met, he met her, they had this whole thing set up and he said, you know, what, what can I bring to it? What can I make it uh, my own? And also, but what could I bring to it? I mean, all these people, uh, when humans meet each other, they wave or they shake hands. Some people bow, some people do this. But what could a Vulcan do? And he thought of something from his childhood, and it was able to be used now. And uh, I'm going to do some re revelation along with it as we talk about it. Low battery already? Seriously? Okay, so let's just go as he talks about this, and then you see this meeting here. I'm going to do it picture in picture. I'm sorry, it's small. But I said to the director, oh, I think we need something that Vulcans do when they greet each other, because we humans have certain kinds of things that we do. We shake hands, we salute each other, we bow to each other in certain cultures. That little last thing she did, putting her hands up to his cheek, ended up later being developed into the Vulcan mind meld, where actually if they make a few temporal points on you that there is this connection and that they get to mind meld with you without you trying to say all these things or expressions it's just known so it's almost a mental hug in some ways but uh, kind of a, a neat thing so he's going to tell you where that came from he said what would you like to do and that's where I came up with this and it came from an experience that I had that obviously made a big impression on me because it happened when I was about eight or nine years old. 
I was in a synagogue with my family, my, uh, in an Orthodox synagogue, the men sitting downstairs, the women upstairs with the Dante. So only the men were downstairs at this time. They have it separated at certain parts in it. And of course, this is at a Jewish synagogue, him being Jewish. And uh, this is an Orthodox, correct form one. And this shows you something that is still today being done. I'm not, no, this is not something I'm trying to tell you about in a video from 3,000 years ago. This is still done today. Let's continue. And with my grandfather, my father, and my brother, and myself, comes a point in the service where the, a group of men, I think there must have been five or six of them, is my memory, uh, they are called Kohanim. They are members of the priestly tribe of the Hebrews. This is the uh, controlling group of it, and then the priestly tribe. But if you'll remember in the actual story, it comes from Levites. So this in some way is a re-representation of Levitical priests. Now, a Levi is the big pointy hat of the Canaanites at that time. So that's another strange thing. The Canaanites had a god named El and Asherah and Baal and all this stuff goes on and if you read the Bible it go, they go back and forth from worshiping these and others and stuff and then finally get their crap straight or we're led to believe that that's what happens but whenever you figure into it what really did happen versus what we're told something else is evident let's continue at this particular moment they get up in front of the congregation face the congregation from the stage, what known as a bima in Hebrew, bima. and they they chant a particular prayer, which is translates into "May the Lord bless you and keep you, may the Lord cause His countenance to shine upon you, may the Lord turn His graciousness unto you and grant you peace." And that's a cool prayer for somebody. This in inevitably led to the idea of live long and prosper whenever he does this symbology. And, you know, funnily, me and my, and my brother, when we were older and stuff, we wanted to say something caring to each other, but too manly to say it and stuff. And, you know, hey, y'all do good, y'all have fun, or try to, you know, something like that and everything. And Keith would say, live long and prosper. And quite often it meant something very deep, the same concept. And, but being in reality, but kind of doing it as bros, as a tongue-in-cheek kind of situation. But this symbology was used in the Orthodox Church. Let's continue. They chanted, they were chanting it in Hebrew. And I'm too young to know what it meant. I'm too young to know why they were gesturing, but they were doing this with their hands facing the congregation. And while they were doing that, my dad was saying to me, don't look. Now, you weren't supposed to look at the sacred symbology of things that were going on. A prayer was de being done over you in a certain way that was a ability that you you couldn't look. Um, and he tells you that this gets, in his mind, it was getting out of hand, like a Holy Roller Church situation, but different in Jewish, where these people were getting way into this moment of being blessed, and he saw what they did. <laughs> Well, there's this crazy fervent chanting going on. They're shouting this prayer in Hebrew, and and they're shaking and they're rocking. It's, it's kind of a, kind of, of a frenzy. And uh, uh, I peeked. I saw what they were doing, and and it's a, kind of a spiritual moment. What he's describing there, where you know they can work themselves up into a frenzy somewhat. And we've talked about that in many religions. How this bringing about of a state is brought about and so he actually but in the process of this he looked uh, I immediately went to work to learn how to do that yeah. I had no idea why they were doing it and much later I found out that this is a, the shape of the letter Shin in the Hebrew alphabet which is the first letter of the word Shaddai which is a name for God and we've talked about it's been a year now but I made a few other videos about it and the deductions on the Bible and stuff and what had been found and this idea that the patriarchs started out worshiping El Shaddai for it's mentioned at first in Genesis and so on and then but still kept secretly and it's written in there but whenever you read the Bible you're not supposed to read it as being that and through the 1619 and then King James it's no longer there anymore and it just says God and so on like that you look at the older versions 
there's all kinds of different names for God, El Roi, El Olam, and they mean different things, you know, and Shaddai is supposed to mean God Almighty. But ironically, Shad is a woman for a word for breasts and mountains, and this God of the mountains, God of the breasts, and it all goes together. Shaddai is a feminine aspect, and he's going to explain that to you right here on the fact that it's it's in the Jewish church that is only Orthodox male. It's the in that there's only one God. There's a, he's the thing. There's no one beside him, like it says in the Bible. All these different things he's going to explain to you that that's not necessarily true. So the sense is they're using a, a symbol of God's name as they bless the congregation with that with that blessing, and they're not supposed to look because I was told many years later that during that benediction. The Shekhinah also starts with a shin, comes into the sanctuary to bless the congregation. So the idea here is that whenever this is going on, that there's a blessing being done in everything, right? Now, in the blessing he gave a minute ago, is may his countenance come upon you in these phrases, which actually is a symbolism of the sun. May the sun shine upon you literally people it comes across to that but that it, it that it, let god's warmth shine upon you may you not be in cloudy days there's a lot of ways to look at this but it's a feminine aspect and you're not supposed to look because she comes in as the dove and lights up the congregation and if you look upon the face of god i mean you can become blinded or even worse, he'll tell you that, but if you stare in the sun, you can be blinded or worse. If you go too close to the sun, you can become Icarus, but let's continue. And this is the feminine aspect of God, and you don't want to see her because the light that emanates from a deity could affect you, could blind you or even worse. So we introduced it that day. The director said, okay, let's do that. So that's how they ended up using it, right there. But he tells you that she, you're not supposed to look upon her. And that he was told much later that he never understood it, but then somebody explained his own religion to him. And at a much later date, he was easily able to accept the idea this was the sacred feminine coming in the church and giving its blessing. Much like what in Catholic, uh, Catholic sex would be mother mary coming in and taking the place of this situation but in reality this was god's counterpart but in reality reality this was kind of like if you would look at the titans and then having giving birth to the next generation which was jesus and see well he was an iteration of his mother and shows you the connection so I just wanted to share that with you and one more example of how things like this and n things that are known were somehow all around me whenever I was a kid constantly, but they're all around you constantly. People still know this gesture and, and you, can, you can do this and it's just that shin, but then there's also this that looks like a W and there are many gestures like this one, which is T in sign language that still keep an essence of certain things that are done with signs and symbology and hand gestures and things that relate to a time whenever you can see that the gods of the Bible were plural as in Elohim and there were quite a few of them in fact there's a way of directive that you can go through Genesis and realize that it's been turned into just one God standing there, but there are supposed to be the gods were standing there, and at certain times, Shakina or Asherah, or the female entity, speaks as El Shaddai, goddess of the breasts, which that is the only way a baby makes it into the world is being able to fulfill that part right there. And so it's extremely important. And even in this religion idea where our people are being attempted to wean. And so you look in the idea of the Bible and you can see that they make 
bad decisions, good decisions, like a child until they end up finding the God or their God. And it shows you the strife of that. There's a lot written into it, but in the same ideology and things, it shows you that all these pagan people had the crap going on, same as you. There wasn't much difference. In fact, that God is someone else's God at the same time. For these Canaanites had the same symbology, same situation, and if it was controlled by a Levitical priest at the time, that would have been a Canaanite priest. I could go into this a little deeper or show you this Yale scholar going off on El Shaddai and how it's used in different names and then comparing it back to it. And I've done it before. But I think that's pretty good. But hey, for all y'all listening, live long and prosper. Peace.